you know, you've got two books coming out. One, which is his personal memoir, and another book that's dealing with religion and philosophy of religion, and uh, Embracing the Void. I preferred the working title, I have to say, which was, can I give the, yeah. Absolutely. Is, the, is nothing sacred? It's so good. I heard you on a podcast or a talk, and you mentioned it. I was like, that, I wish I'd come up with that. So you have to use that for something, but because it is nothing sacred, you know, is, is the nothing sacred. But your publishers, and publishers always do this, they choose the wrong title. And, uh, but Embracing the Voice is very good. I'm not, not disparaging that, but I did like uh, It's Nothing Sacred. But it's a book that, I mean, because religion often, of course, and we all know this, religion often is the thing that gives you the answer. It is the ultimate answer or promises the answer uh, in this life or the next. But you've written this beautiful text. I mean, it's one of the best books of religion I've ever read. Uh, we'll be reading it together when it comes out anybody who would like to with me. But it is a, a reading of religion that puts unknowing in the very heart. And even more so than the unknowing of mysticism. Mystic, mystics have put unknowing into the heart of religion in incredible, poignant ways. But this way that you see unknowing uh, within religion, particularly Christianity, is just a is very profound. So, I mean, how do you see the links between this memoir and your work in religion? Um, it strikes me that, um, yeah, we would do well to become much more focused and much more engaged with this dimension that we're, I think it's true, mostly we're completely unfamiliar with it, except as maybe, you know, like they say in science, that's a, that reaches to the edge of unknowing and then boldly goes forward and takes another step in knowledge. To think of the unknowing as a positive, a relationship with something positive, that's what is almost completely missing. Uh, but it strikes me that from the beginning, if we go back to the lovers at the candlelit table, looking moon-eyed at each other and saying, my God, we've always known each other. I wonder if what's really going on is much more a seduction of what we barely, vaguely imagine is the unknown in this other across the table. What's, the, what's on promise? What might be possible? What is, who deeply is this person who I'm only touching, of whom I'm only touching the surface? And I also wonder whether or not what we call a really successful relationship, a successful love relationship, is the one where we keep alive that sense of an adventure of discovery that we don't know all about them yet. They've got a lot more to show us and teach us and share with us. I mean, isn't this the most common thing in couples therapy? You know you've got a really bad case when they, one of the members of the couple turns to the other one and says, Oh, God, not that again. I hate it when you say that. You always say that. You are so boring. You're so predictable. This is like when you know you're really in trouble. As opposed to something I think we're not accustomed to is really being alert to the depths of the other that have yet escaped you and maybe even escape them, but that you might, um, in your love relation, be able to contact in some way and grow with and learn from. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, you know the difference between, say, classic science, classical Newtonian science, where the unknowing is like when I watch YouTube videos or I'm bored. I always like to watch YouTube videos and things I don't know anything about, <laughs> the, the chemistry or computers. It's just fun to watch something you don't know, and there's a kind of knowledge that stuff, there's things I don't know, but I can in principle know them and almost like we're pushing knowledge further and further out as we go along. So there's what we know, and then there's what we don't know, that vast ocean, and we're pushing out into that ocean. And then in kind of quantum science and quantum physics, you have this notion that there's not just the unknowing of what we don't yet know, but there's something that we don't know within our knowledge. There's, you know, this, we can't, there, there's a fuzziness within. And I think of that in terms of love as well. There's, you, can, you can not know someone because you haven't met them, but then there's the not knowing someone 
when you meet them. So it's, it's that unknowing. It's not simply a lack of knowledge that we can someday f fill in, mm -hmm. but there's something that's like, they're at, this very, at the very base of reality or the base of the other person that can never be known, not just because you lack the ability, but if you had a mind of God, you would know that person. But even if you had the mind of God, there'd still be a dimension of mystery. Yeah, in this, in this respect, maybe uh, we're on the edge of some readjustment of our sense of ourselves, our epistemological coordinates. Because I think that what I'm trying to argue about knowing and unknowing in the love relation is very parallel to what physicists now and, and cosmologists now talk about when they s tell us that all this stuff, this, the matter that we can step on, is 15% of the matter in the universe. The rest of it is dark matter. It is utterly invisible and undetectable by us, except theoretically. I wonder if that isn't 85% of the other human being, and ourselves as well, that is the dark matter, which is most ways out there.